Okay, 15 past 12, I think it's time to start. Um, hello everyone, uh, a very good afternoon and welcome to this uh, symposium uh, sponsored by G-Healthcare. Uh, my name is Marco Lucchetti, I'm the medical director for uh, Europe, Middle East and Africa at G-Healthcare. And today um, we are going to speak about uh, different ways to elevate uh, perioperative care by improving patient safety and workflow efficiency. Uh, we will have three prominent speakers today and each of them will be presenting for 15 minutes. Then we'll have around 10 minutes, hopefully in the end for, for question and answers. Uh, we will we'll use a Slido app, so uh, on-site participants uh, and also remote participants can um, input your, your question on Slido app, but you can also reach out to those two microphones. You have one there and one on the other side. So if you want to speak up and ask questions in the end, you, you, you are welcome to do so. Um, and, and, uh, and now, without further ado, uh, let me introduce the, the, the moderator of this session, Dr. Justin Kirk Bailey he is going to chair the SIMPO and also will be one of the speakers and also facilitate in the end the Q&A session. Justin Kirk Bailey is an intensivist and anesthetist from Guildford, England. Uh, he trained in the United Kingdom and Australia, has been using clinical ultrasound for over 20 uh, years and forms part of the UK group shaping training and education in point of care ultrasound in intensive care. He was the first in the UK to run a dedicated apprentice style fellowship on intensive care ultrasound and is invited internationally to talk on point of care diagnostics. Justin, please, the floor is yours and, and up to you to introduce the other speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce my first speaker today, and we have Frédéric Michard. He's a critical care MD and PhD. He trained in Paris, France, and also in Boston, the United States. He's known for his research work and publication with over 12,000 citations on Google Scholar on pulse pressure variation, PPV, fluid responsiveness, hemodynamic monitoring, and more recently on digital innovations, AI-enabled tools, and also wearable sensors. Since 2016, he's been running a consulting and research firm, Myco, based in Switzerland. And Frederick is going to talk to us about protecting patients, the case for wireless wearables on the wards. So, Frederick, thank you very much. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Thanks a lot for the invitation. Um, yes, first of all, I'd like to disclose the fact that, or repeat the fact that I'm today leading a consulting and a research company, Myco, based in Switzerland where we focus on uh, digital innovations with medical applications. So why should we monitor our patients differently? As you know better, better than me, uh, many patients go to the hospital for surgery and have to stay for complications. Uh, this is uh, the large international surgical outcome study published a few years ago in the British Journal of Anesthesia, showing that on average, 17% of surgical patients develop at least one postoperative complication. It's more, it's 27% after a major surgery. So clearly, many high-risk surgical patients develop uh, postoperative complications, and these complications may be detected with a delay, uh, mainly because nurses are uh, spot-checking vital signs from time to time, usually every four to six or eight hours. And now we are able to monitor vital signs continuously. We can quantify actually how much we miss uh, with this intermittent spot check. So this is a, a very interesting study from the Cleveland Clinic where nurses were um, measuring vital signs every four hours. And they realized that they were missing 82% of hypoxemic events and 79% of hypotensive events. So obviously we are missing a lot, many events, many adverse events uh, with intermittent monitoring. We all know opioids may induce respiratory depression, and there is today a consensus to say that no patient should be armed by opioid-induced respiratory depression. I will here simply quote Dan Sessler in this editorial published in Anesthesiology a few years ago. It is likely that many catastrophic respiratory events could be prevented if we were monitoring continuously our respiratory variables. 
The nurse to patient ratio is often suboptimal, suboptimal sorry, on the world. We all know that. And I like this systematic review published in surgery a few years ago showing a relationship, an inverse relationship between failure to rescue, that is to say deaths related to postoperative complication, and the nurse staffing level. So here we have two options. We can either dramatically increase the number of nurses working on surgical wards, but we all know it's not going to happen. Or we can try to improve the way we monitor patient on the wards and the way we detect uh, clinical deterioration. In hospital cardiac arrest, often occur on the wards. This is a very interesting uh, audit study published by the team of Jerry Nolan, done in the UK. You see a large number of acute hospital, a very large number of in-hospital cardiac arrest. And as a matter of fact, the majority of these arrests are occurring on regular wards, not in very acute settings like the ICU or the emergency department. There is also obviously a trend towards the admission of older patients with multiple comorbidities who are at higher risk of clinical deterioration. And the problem is that overwhelmed ICUs cannot always cope with the surge of acutely ill patients. It became obvious uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, and that's why with Bernd Sobel from Germany and Benoit Vallée from France, we propose not only to increase the number of ICU beds, but also to upgrade the way we monitor patients on regular wards. And it's possible because there are now today remote and wireless monitoring solutions available. So which variable should we monitor more closely? There are different ways to answer that question. We can first look at uh, triggers for rapid response team activation. And you see these four vital signs are actually very useful. Um, rapid response team are very often activated by a rise in heart rate, a low SpO2, a rise in respiratory rate, or a decrease in blood pressure. Another way to answer the question is to look at uh, studies using machine learning algorithms to predict severe adverse events, for instance, cardiac arrest, the need for ICU transfer or death. And this is an example, a study published uh, in the US uh, a few years ago. And then they ranked uh, vital signs according to their predictive value in their machine learning model. And you think respiratory rate was actually uh, ranked number one. What are now the existing remote and uh, wireless solutions? So clearly to measure or monitor pulse rate, it's not a big deal, you need a pulse oximeter. To monitor uh, uh, heart rate, sorry, or uh, ECG one lead, you need uh, two skin electrodes, which are today very often combined in the same sensor. To monitor ISPO2, you need a pulse oximeter. There are miniaturized pulse oximeters now available. I mean, they have been increasingly used uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, mainly for self-monitoring, but we could use them as well for continuous uh, monitoring uh, on hospital wards. Pending, of course, they are used in combination with a getaway that will continuously transmit the information to the central station or directly to the pager or the smartphone of the nurse. Respiratory rate, as I said, is probably the most important variable to monitor because the most sensitive abnormal in many different uh, situations, not only in case of uh, respiratory complications, but it's still today the neglected vital sign. So that's why I think so many uh, methods and techniques have been proposed over the last uh, five years uh, to better monitor and to monitor continuously respiratory wards in ambulatory patients, respiratory rates or in, in ambulatory patients. So I'm not going to describe all these methods. I'm just going to uh, share with you a few examples. I mean, this is an adhesive patch using ECG variability and accelerometer data to compute respiratory rate. And this is a so-called validation study uh, using a reference method on the x-axis. And you see that only 77% of the measurements were in the safe zones A and B of the Clark Air grid. This one is a different system with free electrodes using an impedance pneumography. It's wireless system. And you see same kind of validation study, this time with over 99% of uh, measurements in the safe zones A and B of the Clark Air grid. But just to highlight that all systems have not been created equal. The reason why this uh, system is working pretty well is probably because when you have three electrodes, you have at least two signals. One that could be an abdominal signal and the other one a thoracic signal. So if for any reason, like in this example, you don't get uh, the information from the abdominal signal, uh, very likely you will get it from the other one. 
Blood pressure. Blood pressure is uh, still the, the challenging variable. There are a few uh, methods which have been proposed, but I think none of them is really ready for prime time. The, some are based on the pulse wave transit time or the pulse rival time method. So when you monitor con uh, continuously ECG and pulse oximetry, you can combine these two signals uh, to uh, predict or estimate blood pressure, or if not blood pressure, at least uh, to detect changes in blood pressure. What's probably more promising, or at least more exciting, is using machine learning simply with a pulse oximetry waveform. The idea is to feed a machine learning algorithm with a huge number of uh, pulse oximetry waveform and corresponding blood pressure values. And then the machine learning system will learn how to recognize specific patterns characteristic of changes in blood pressure, either a decrease or a rise in blood pressure. So this is an example. This is a study coming from uh, Lausanne University Hospital, the group of Patrick Schottker. They used exclusively the pulse oximetry waveform to track changes in blood pressure uh, during anesthesia induction. And you see on the left-hand side, the systolic arterial pressure changes. On the right-hand side, the mean arterial pressure changes. And obviously, it was working pretty well. But of course, one of the key questions is, I mean, are these tools really useful to improve patient safety? At the end of the day, this is what really matters. The idea is, of course, to detect at an earlier stage clinical deterioration and then to have time to prevent severe adverse events, and so ultimately decrease rapid response team calls, ICU admissions, and cardiac arrest. That's the concept. And interestingly, actually, there are already several um, outcome studies confirming um, what we expect is actually happening. This is a table we published with Carl Kalkman already two, uh, two years ago in anesthesiology. At that time, we had five studies, which are very large studies, reporting a decrease in rapid response team calls, a decrease in ICU admission, a decrease in chronic arrest. I have updated the table for this uh, presentation. Today we have actually nine studies for a total of over 150,000 patients showing clinical benefits when monitoring vital signs continuously. Of course, there are challenges to implementation. And to better understand, I mean, uh, expectations from anesthesiologists, but also challenges, we, we did a survey last year we surveyed over 1,000 anesthesiologists from Western Europe and from uh, the US. And to the question, what are the main implementation challenges, they all said number one is economic. And I think it's important to realize that if we can effectively decrease ICU admission, we should be able actually to save money. Uh, this is a small but interesting study uh, coming from the US where they implemented continuous monitoring on a small uh, hospital ward. And they actually reported savings ranging between 200 and 700 per patient with an hospital break-even after six to nine months. That's another one, a very recent one. It's a modelization showing that uh, continuous vital sign monitoring in a medical surgical unit uh, may enable savings ranging between three and seven million dollars a year per average uh, US hospital. The second challenge is uh, connectivity IT, and we are all familiar with disruption when we are using Bluetooth connectivity, and that's an example where uh, you see 22 patients on the y-axis. On the x-axis, you have seven days, so 22 patients who are monitored with a wireless, using a wireless sensor using a Bluetooth connectivity. In green, it's when actually they were receiving the signal. In red, it's when they were not receiving the signal, and you see for some patients, it was really a big problem. So just to put things into perspective, if you monitor patients from home, by definition, they are not very sick, so I don't think you need really continuous monitoring. If you get some kind of repeated spot check, it's not a big deal. So Bluetooth is possibly acceptable. In the hospital, no. I mean, if you stay in the hospital, you need to be sure that your vitals will, will be monitored continuously 100% of the time. So that's why we need medical-grade connectivity protocols. Nurse pushback is classical as well because nurses have in mind existing monitoring systems. I think it's very important to understand that uh, these systems are now equipped with smart algorithm, uh, helping to filter artifacts and prevent false alarms. But it's also important to acknowledge that at the very beginning of the implementation phase, that may, may be associated with a, a small uh, increase in, uh, work, in uh, nurse workload. But clearly the idea after a few months is actually to decrease nurse workload because you know of these uh, repetitive tasks measuring vital signs uh, manually. It will be done automatically and continuously. Last but not uh, least, I like this one. You know where alarms should be heard. 
I was glad to see only 12% of anesthesiologists consider it should be heard in the patient room, because I think it's important to realize alarms have not been designed to disturb patients, but to inform clinicians. So I think we need our systems able to keep uh, quiet, silent in the room, and simply inform uh, clinicians uh, on the central station or on the smartphone. So in conclusion, I hope you agree with me. It's time to rethink the way we monitor patients and hospital wards. Clinical deterioration may be overlooked for hours. It makes sense to believe so, but we have evidence quantifying that. Solutions now exist for the automatic, continuous, and mobile monitoring of vital signs. They may help to improve patient safety and satisfaction and to decrease ICU admission and related costs. So if tomorrow you want to implement such a uh, a system in your own hospital, here is my wish list and recommendation. You need a mobile solutions because we all know that after surgery, early mobilization is a key element of enhanced recovery programs. So out, capnography, bed sensors, video monitoring. You need something comfortable to wear, otherwise it will never be accepted by patients. You need something easy to use, otherwise it will never be accepted by nurses. You need medical grade connectivity, otherwise you will have disruptions all the time. You need a system able to keep uh, quiet, silent uh, in the patient room to respect patient and uh, improve recovery as well. And of course, data have to be transmitted to the electronic medical record system so that scores like the early warning score, or even more sophisticated score can be calculated automatically. With that, I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Frederic, for your excellent presentation. Uh, now it's time to move on to the next speaker, Justin Kirk Bailey. We already learned about his background and expertise, so today we'll speak about the power of the ultrasound probe you already have. Please, Justin. Thank you, Marco. So, I've been in love with ultrasound for about 20 years now, as I've said, um, and my disclosures are that I work in the NHS in the UK as a full-time intensive anaesthetist, and probably not a day goes by where I don't integrate ultrasound into my clinical practice, and I've been kindly sponsored by GE to talk to you today. I'm hoping that in the next 14 and a half minutes, I can give you some inspiration. Open your eyes to ultrasound if you don't use it, or if you do use it, at least give you some new horizons and show you how it is developing and how it's going to improve your practice. I'm assuming with the title of the Congress that it's Euroanesthesia. Most people do anesthesia, but also I do ITU, so there's some extra bits for ITU as well. And of course, the two worlds definitely collide on a day-to-day -day basis. So where have we come to? What's the past of ultrasound? Well, most of us sort of cut our teeth on a machine like this that's appeared in the operating theatres or in the intensive care unit. And we've got a high-frequency linear probe there that's allowed us, mostly as our introduction to the use of clinical ultrasound, to put in central venous access devices. And we spent a bit of time as residents, as trainee anaesthetists, trying to work out where the bounce of the internal jugular vein is, not sticking our line into the carotid, and making sure that we can then not puncture the lungs and improve our safety profile. That's where most people get their introductions to medical ultrasound when they're anesthesiologists or intensivists. Some people are a little bit more lightened, and they have an introduction into regional anaesthesia. And of course, ultrasound has really taken off in the world of regional anaesthesia. And there are lots of talks in the next couple of days all about that. First thing you tend to learn to do is to scan up from the supraclavicular brachial plexus up towards the interscalene, work out where one of the more relatively easy blocks are, and be able to put your local anaesthesia and deliver anaesthesia for shoulder and arm surgery. That's kind of where most of us cut our teeth. That's where we started. That's where we got the stabilizers, and that's where we've moved on from. But there's an awful lot more going on with ultrasound in anesthesia and intensive care at the moment. There's a huge amount of work. Not a day goes by without publishing of papers in various aspects, and you'll see some of the stuff, obviously, around and about. I'm going to open your eyes to some things that may be useful to you, because that's what I want to talk about. Imagine a situation whereby you're anticipating a difficult laryngoscopy. Not all patients have surface anatomy that looks like this when you're trying to think where the cricothyroid membrane might be. Just when you go down to plan D and think, actually, I might have to have some emergency front of neck access. It can be quite difficult to palpate patients, especially if you have patients like this, which turn up on my anesthesia list all too frequently. If I want to think about what's going to happen if I can't secure my airway and I want to pre-mark up where the cricothyroid membrane might be, I can't do it by palpation. 
And they definitely can't do it by palpation. So this group got a load of uh, uh, subjects, and what they did is they gave them 10 seconds, 10 seconds to work out where that cricothyroid membrane was in a group of patients with increasing body mass indices. And as you can see, actually, their distance to where the membrane really was was even harder the larger the patients. And that really reflects real life, doesn't it? Because it is incredibly difficult. So imagine if you could use ultrasound. Imagine if you could see beneath the skin and you could work out exactly where you're going. So I've got my ultrasound probe here, and I'm scanning from head down to toe, from cephalad to colad. The superficial structure that's pointy and comes up to the skin, especially mostly in men, is the thyroid cartilage. And as I come down then towards the toes, down towards the bottom of the patient, I then start to get this very, very clear, white, highly echogenic membrane with reverberations for the air tissue border. That is my cricothyroid membrane. It's really easy to see. The ultrasound is very sensitive and very specific. And then I come down and then I'll get my cricoid cartilage. So that reverberation changes. So once I've worked out where it is that my membrane is, what I do is I come back to the reverberation and I get my pen and I put a marker on. Actually, what I use in practice is I get a two milliliter syringe. I suck up a little bit of tissue from the uh, skin and I leave a mark on the skin there by sucking it up with a plunger that lasts about half an hour. Because things happen, patients get sweaty, I get sweaty if there's a difficult airway and the mark moves. Whereas if I leave that marker, I can see it. You can also have it in sagittal plane, of course. This is something that's referred to as the string of pearl sign. I can have a look and if I put an overlay here for anatomy, what we can see is we've got reverberation from all the tracheal rings on the right-hand side of the screen, and then we've got the cricoid and the thyroid cartilage is in between. You can see it's nice and bright and white with lots of nice reverberations as well down there for the membrane. And it makes it pretty easy to see where it would be if I had to access it in an emergency. It's actually quite a good-sized target. This is a trial that we did in Guildford here, looking at ultrasound to see what we can do to improve people's ability to be able to detect it. And we've marked up where it genuinely is on ultrasound previously, put it in ultraviolet so that they can't see it, and then ask them to use ultrasound versus palpation and have a look. And there's their target. It's not too small. But here's a paper that got to publication before us from a group, and they got 120 people. And they said, what's the difference in accuracy between palpation and ultrasound? And it's an 80% compared to an 8% variation. You can see a very tight grouping in the blue dots there for the people using ultrasonographic detection. Really useful. Consider doing that in your day-to-day -day practice of anesthesia. Whilst we're looking at the front of the neck, if we move to the side to where we were looking at before, looking at the internal jugular vein for cannulation, you'll see there's a little something on the left-hand side of the patient, and that's the esophagus. In the UK, we're often taught in our training that the esophagus sits behind the trachea, so if you press down on the cricoid cartilage, it will occlude it and stop regurgitation. Not so. The esophagus sits very much to the left-hand side, as I've highlighted up here. And if you accidentally intubate it, instead of endotracheal intubation, you get something called the double trachea sign. And it's pretty obvious. Here goes. So once you see that on ultrasound, if you have somebody who's got a probe sitting there with a, uh, their probe ready to go on the trachea, if you accidentally intubate the esophagus, it will be very obvious to the onlooker. You'll be able to detect that even before you do any gas insufflation. You won't inflate the stomach with any volatile gases or air or oxygen and increase the risk of aspiration, especially when you're doing a rapid sequence induction. Of course, this will happen before you actually do any insufflation, so you won't get any capnography in the esophagus anyway, but then you'll have to have a look and see if this occurs. If you are in the trachea and you start insufflating, you will get capnography. So what I'm saying is, is that this is a positive prediction. So in the UK, we have a new phrase, which is if there is no capnographic trace, then the tube is in the wrong place. But if you see this, the double trachea sign, then your tube is definitely in the wrong place. And you then don't have to waste some valuable time by trying to work it out. This is probably the best study I found on this basis, which is a group of Saudi doctors. And they've got 120 residents newly qualified in their anaesthesia, and they've given them time to be able to have a look at what's going on with ultrasound to see whether or not the tube is endotracheal or esophageal. And they found that they were able to decide when there was an esophageal intubation a full 15 seconds faster, and it was pretty clear. If you then go all the way up to waiting for six capnographic waveforms, it's up to 30 seconds faster. That doesn't sound like an awful long time, but if you have a difficult airway situation and you've got a patient who's rapidly desaturating in front of you, 30 seconds can feel like 30 minutes, as I'm sure you're all too aware. 
What about interoperatively? What can we do there? What about a situation where you've got a patient who's on the table, they've come to you for emergency surgery, they've got a nasty chest infection, and suddenly your ventilation isn't working quite as well as it was. They're desaturating, you've just intubated them. Yeah, it was a bit difficult, but you're not too sure what's going on. You've had a listen with your stethoscope, kind of sounds okay, I've got equal breath sounds, but it's not quite right. Can you use ultrasound? So, the left of the wall, I can see the blur sliding. But the right just doesn't look right. So you can put a high-frequency linear probe at the APCs of the lung, and you can actually have a look and see what's going on with ultrasound. Far more sensitive and specific for ventilation than it is with auscultation. You can see the lung. Let me show you what it looks like. So this is the kind of picture that you're going to get at about three and a half centimeters on a relatively thin person with the ultrasound probe. Let's mark up some anatomy for you. You've got skin and superficial fat tissues with a varial degree. Then you've got the chest wall muscles below those. You've got ribs. When we're looking in that rib space between them, right up at the apices, of course, more superior to that will be the clavicle. We've got the intercostal muscles there, internal and external. We've got an acoustic rib shadow, which is the dark bit that sits below. And then we've got this pleura, which when I show it back to you will be a white line that moves backwards and forwards, like little marching ants, backwards and forwards with the ventilation movement of the lung. And of course, below that, we have the lung. Let me animate that for you so you can see that clearly. So this is a normal lung being ventilated, moving backwards and forwards. As the lung expands, the peripheral, parietal and visceral pleura rub against each other, and you get these little dots as the lobular uh, tissues move. What happens when it goes wrong, though? So here we are, my colleague Matt decides that there's a real problem. Nothing at all, there's, there's no sliding whatsoever. No sliding whatsoever, he's saying to me, okay? What's going on? He's looked on the right-hand side here, something's happening. So here's his view again. If you look at that white line that's moving, rather than just sliding backwards and forwards left and right, it's kind of pulsing, isn't it? This is called lung pulse. This is a sign of atelectasis, absent distal expansion. Interoperatively, there are a few reasons for that. It could be a sputum plug, which seems clinically likely if you've got a patient with a chest infection. But actually, if this is on the side of non-ventilation, you may end up with an endotracheal intubation. I, for one, do that sometimes if I'm intubating under duress, and I can find that actually I need to pull my tube back. There are ways of finding out where your tube insertion depth should be, an ultrasound as well, and there are increasing validatory work for that too. But it becomes really obvious. But if I'm not totally sure, I can drop this yellow line at the top there, which we call M mode, to slice across. And along the bottom there is a moving line that's got horizontal lines with little vertical bars across it, and we call those T lines. That, to me, says that that lung is not ventilating for whatever the reason is. I may have listened, and I can hear transmitted breath sounds from the other side, but I definitively know that there is a problem. Quick and easy and all there for you. In the UK, Regional Anesthesia UK, who are affiliated with the European Society of Regional Anesthesia, have put out this thing called their Plan A blocks. They say that all anaesthetists should be able to undertake seven regional anaesthesia blocks. They've picked the most efficacious and probably the most easy to deliver blocks. They think everybody should be able to do them. And I agree with them because actually they're really useful. And somebody should be able to pick up something probably in their region of anaesthesia, whatever they undertake. But I put this to you as well and show you that actually with these new high frequency probes, with the new machines that have got increased post-processing as well, it's really very easy to see stuff. This is the posterior border of my own sternocleidomastoid muscle and sitting up atop it will be able to see my posterior auricular nerve. If I scan up and down, it goes left and right. So if I then put that forwards and I scan that, why do I want to see it? See if you can track it with your eyes. Okay, because when it sits down by the posterior border of sternocleidomastoid, that's exactly where the superficial cervical plexus sits. If I put one mil of local anaesthetic there, I can have anaesthesia to the whole of the anterior border of the neck. That's really useful for when I have on my emergency list people having vascular lines inserted, be they for hemodiafiltration or for central venous access for uh, peripheral, uh, parental nutrition or for vasopressors. It's really useful. If I play that again, what I've done here is I've actually post-processed it myself and I've put a little marker on there for you to be able to see it in red. That's me doing it in my Adobe software at home. But with a new generation of equipment available, for example, with companies like Intelligent Ultrasound, you can actually have this in real time and you can teach people to be able to have a look at. And of course, that marries up beautifully for regional anesthesia. 
And as a result of these increases in high frequency, it may well be that the last time you looked, there's an increased number of regional anesthetic blocks that you could use. There are RIS blocks and PENG blocks and IPAT blocks, and it's all thanks to this increased resolution. So have another look and see if there's some new blocks that are made available to you with increased quality of regional anesthesia. I have to say for the interest of balance that when I looked at the evidence behind my beloved superficial cervical plexus block with regional anaesthesia, it's not faster and apparently it doesn't give any increased patient benefit or satisfaction. But in my practice, I teach all my residents and my trainees to be able to do it because it actually means that they can be very sparing with a local anaesthetic and not distort the anatomy for insertion. What about the future? We're here to talk about the future. Well, the future... AI, of course, everybody's talking about it. But the machines are also getting much smaller. I said that there are lots of these around, but they're certainly shrinking. And as an intensivist, I go and do outreach, and I go out and about, and I have one of these. I literally have this in my pocket, and I'm able to see things. And what are we starting to see? We're seeing stuff that's developed on the larger machines coming to the smaller ones that are really useful. So back to AI. Well, it's not quite AI. I don't have chat GPT attached to my anesthetic uh, ultrasound machine, but I certainly have some machine learning, and I've got a couple of things that are really useful. If we have a curvilinear probe, low frequency 1 to 5 megahertz, they're actually fantastic for looking at the whole of the lungs. So rather than just looking at the top, I can do a whole sweep of all of the lungs, and I can stitch it together. So the machine learning then, rather than giving me these eight points as separate, Static images, not quite sure what's going on. I can put them all together and I can get a proper dynamic look of the whole of the ventilation of the lung. And I can then spot, or at least if somebody else takes a lung sweep and sends the imagery to me, uploads it to my PAC system or even re remotely sends it to me, I can work out where the problem is in the lungs and I can say what's going on. That may be useful to me as an anaesthetist intensivist, but I'm finding it increasingly useful for directing physiotherapists who are doing chest physio for my patients as well. And certainly this is beautiful for detecting not only pneumothoraces, but also how big the pneumothoraces are and deciding whether or not, depending on the underlying etiology, whether or not I need to put a chest rein in or I can conservatively manage it. Really handy. If you end up interfacing with cardiology sometimes and you've got a patient who has reduced cardiac function, what do they want to know? Well, they want to know those magic words. What's the ejection fraction? Tell me about the EF. Sometimes you'll know that preoperatively because they've had preoperative echocardiography. That's fine. But then when it all goes wrong interoperatively, how on earth do I know? It's a nice objective measure for comparisons. If you don't know how to do it and it's not basic ultrasonography or echocardiography, why not let the machine do it? Then we add the third probe to our family, which is in the middle there, which is a cardiac phase array probe. A lot of the machines out and about, as you can see now, have got three probes on them because then you've got the full gamut of, of probe technology to be able to use. If you're able to get one of these, which is an apical four chamber view, or on the right hand side of the screen there is the left ventricle and the left atrium, the machine will then tell you what the ejection fraction is, 60%, nice and normal, okay? But it also tells you how it's doing it. So if you've got any skepticism from your cardiological friends, they can have a look at it and say, okay, I get that. That's a fractional error change. I believe the computer. And then you can quantify that in relationship to how it was before with the patient. So I think with the future, you'll be able to branch out and you'll be able to develop. I think if you haven't had a good look at what's available with ultrasound, you should be able to grow definitely Increase your capabilities, there's new technologies and new clarities available. And whatever's going on, the future definitely is bright, but it still has a future that's very much black and white. Thank you very much. Thank you, Justin. Thank you very much. It's, it's really amazing uh, to, to see how, how many new applications of ultrasound have, have been uh, implemented in the last 10 years uh, because it's really uh, be, it's really an explosion of new 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 tools that you may 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 use for ultrasound it's it's really wonderful so what we can say it may the power of the ultrasound probe be with with you all i mean it's a um, it's really a, a technique uh, that that needs to be uh, deployed in, in, in full. So, uh, Justin, will you please introduce the next speaker? Um. Absolutely. Thank you, Marco. Um, so our next speaker today is Jan Grico. He's an MD, anesthesiologist. He's currently working in the Department of Anesthesia and Intensive Care of the Calmo University Hospital in Nîmes, in France. He studied at Montpellier Nîmes School of Medicine and trained also at the University of California, Los Angeles. 
He holds a master's degree in health services and clinical research from the University of Lyon. He's completing a PhD degree about regional anesthesia and opioid-free anesthesia, and his clinical research interests include quality improvement, clinical decision-making, patient experience, and regional anesthesia. And Dr. Grecor today is going to speak to us about how care station insights can help elevate perioperative care. So, Jan, over to you. Thank you so much. Hello, hello everyone. Thank you for your presence today. It's almost time for a coffee break, but I'm going to spend a little minute with you talking about how care station inside can help the perioperative uh, care. I have only one uh, conflict of interest. But before talking about technology, I would like to introduce uh, this concept about one of the experience I had was I was um, in fellowship at UCLA and talking about how what we know uh, in guidelines, but what we don't necessarily apply in the operating room. As you know, uh, the opioid crisis uh, was a big uh, difficulties for USA and a big challenge for anesthesiologists in the United States. And when I was on fellow uh, at UCLA, we did a, a study to uh, assess the prescription of uh, opioid at hospital discharge. And interestingly, we found that uh, in opioid-free uh, anesthesia for colorectal surgery, uh, contrary to what we might expect, almost all patients uh, were discharged with opioid prescription at the end of uh, their uh, hospital stay. It was a huge uh, message for the team, and immediately they changed behavior of a practitioner. So what does it mean? Because following this uh, example, the question is, how can you measure and how can you change your practices uh, in your anesthesia department? Because collecting uh, a general anesthesia is a very big challenge for you guys uh, every day. And the technology might help you every day to assist different practitioners, anesthesiologists or just nurse uh, anesthetic to delivering a quality anesthesia. And today, by using two different examples from just the daily practice and daily complication, we are going to talk about how the care station solution may improve the perioperative outcome and at the same time, how it can help healthcare practitioner to change in their behavior in the operating room. So, recent uh, low uh, ventilation, uh, protective ventilation guidelines uh, have been um, published for surgical patients, and these guidelines are generally um, known for a practitioner, but not always applied. The LPV triad is just three different points that I guess you already know, guys. A, tid a low tidal volume, uh, a PIP, and different uh, recruitment manners. So it's easy that the goal of this uh, triad is to improve um, perioperative um, outcomes such as reduce the postoperative pulmonary complication and at the same time improve the intraoperative uh, pulmonary function. But in your anesthesia department, how can you be sure that these guidelines are already applied uh, in your daily practice? And to respond to this question, you need just uh, objective uh, data. So if you look at um, uh, regarding manual data collection, you have several limitations, such as being time consuming, that's the real life, and at the same time, you can have mistakes regarding the human data collection. So what is the solution to get automatically collection of this data and finally to improve the quality of the collection of this data? So um, the Care Station Inside solution is a software developed by General Electric that provides a data collection and the way it's very easy to understand that it captures and analyzes over 300 uh, data points from the anesthesia machine, from the monitoring devices, such with parameters such as uh, gas value, um, ventilation setting, <coughs> blood pressure, many, many uh, outcomes that are uh, recommended to, uh, to monitor for general anesthesia. So um, a couple of years ago, it was before uh, 
COVID-19 uh, crisis. Uh, in collaboration with uh, General Electric uh, in my team at hospital, we uh, conduct a study uh, using the Pure Station uh, solution, data solution, to assess the team behavior regarding the uh, lung protective ventilation. So let's take a, a few moments on this slide about the TD uh, protocol. Our study was a before-after study, uh, and it consists of five different uh, sequential phases, starting with a, a baseline uh, analysis of our practices. And then we have different uh, steps, different uh, periods, where we assess uh, clinical uh, outcomes with uh, educational session about LPV, with staff lecture with the team or just a meeting with um, nurses anesthetic. And the, at, at the first steps, we add pop-up message uh, on the screen on computer when a um, practitioner connecting the uh, general anesthesia. So um, the primary outcomes of this uh, monocentric study was the staff adherence to the three point of the LPV. So at the beginning, so at the baseline, the LPV uh, um, adherence was only 7% in our team. And we can see over the time with different uh, uh, steps, pop-up and uh, educational program, we can see the personnel keep increasing over the time with a peak at 28% when we add a uh, digital pop-up. And uh, with the over time, it decreased at 22%. But the main message of this study is finally with Additional with um, data collection and different uh, way of education, the staff adherence to the LPV point, which is a good thing for our patient, was increasing over the time. Now, with a second example, let's talk about uh, the challenge of the intraoperative hypotension. You know all that there is no uh, widely uh, accepted definition of the hypotension, uh, and it's keep being a huge challenge for uh, for the daily practice. You already know that uh, with this uh, guideline that you can have um, an organ injury when you have uh, a low uh, MAP exposure during surgery, and uh, especially when you're increasing the duration of this uh, hypotension. But more than the low map, you have the triple low concept that is a strong predictor of a pre, um, postoperative mortality. So if you take a moment, <coughs> just as a question, you have every day in your practice many, many parameters. And if you take a look at the uh, intraoperative analysis of all of these parameters, it's very important. Why? But first thing is to improve if you look at this, you improve your real-time anesthesia drug delivery. It's what you already do, I guess. But if you look at these parameters, you can track the, comp the protocol compliance of the parameters uh, every day in your operating room. So um, let's introduce the Iowa uh, adequacy of anesthesia concept uh, made by General Electric. It's made up of different parameters we, which helps the clinician to assess in the real time different patient individual response to the drug delivery with hypnotic, opioids, and NMBA drugs. In other words, the AWA gives a kind of feedback to the clinician uh, to help to optimize at the end uh, the anesthetic drug um, administration. So about the hour administration, parameters provide it's a continuous non-invasive uh, measurement of three points. The first one is the state of the brain with the uh, SE entropy, the patient response to the surgical stimulation with the SPI, and the state of the uh, muscle relaxation with uh, the NMT. So let's take a moment together to see uh, how it looks on your screen uh, in your operating room. 
Um, this is a um, screenshot of the, our dashboard, the configuration. This is the first step you have to put uh, with your team. So before compiling and analyzing all of the data you are producing uh, in your department, you have to, um, you have, to uh, have some uh, rates and some um, targets with your team, some target range for each parameter, such as um, uh, SE, SPR, or just take a look and about unwanted events such as low map or uh, bradycardia. So, first, thing, first step is to uh, put in the computer a kind of range that you want to work with it for the rest of the uh, anesthesia. As you are um, save these parameters, you can start to track your uh, team progression over the time because you have uh, a huge feedback of what's going on or just adapt in the real time what's going on in your operating room or in your anesthesia department. So this is another screenshot of what you can see with your team because the hour monitoring is displayed on two pages. The first one is the hour statue and the second one is the hour analysis. Um, this is the hour uh, statue, the first step, and it offers a kind of a real time view of what's going on in your operating room. I can compare it with the ground control room in the airport because you can see uh, the number of operating room and different uh, anesthesia statues, the emergence, maintenance, or um, um, induction of your anesthesia. So it's a kind of big control of what's going on in your operating room. And the second step. Um, you put different uh, target for your team and for your uh, machine. So you have the our analysis uh, um, that give you in all of the different uh, connecting operating room data uh, to follow what's going on. Let me focus. You can s there is uh, many many uh, information in this slide, but just focus on a few of them. You can see the protocol compliance uh, over the time, and you can see the benefit of, for example, an educational program of your team. And you see that after uh, uh, education and pop up and things like this, you have a better protocol compliance of target ranges. If you uh, focus on unwanted uh, events such as intraoperative hypotension, you can follow uh, when people are in the range or not with this uh, green uh, point or uh, red point. So the advantage of this dashboard is to give you a huge view of what's going on in the, in the past and to follow different uh, protocol compliance when you, have to, when you want to just to try to improve uh, your team management. And an interesting thing, because sometimes you can have the question, these activities uh, are completely anonymous. I mean that you don't have information about the patient name, you don't have the information about the practitioner name, so it's completely anonymous. You can see what's going on in this room, but uh, it's not a kind of tracking behind you to see if you are, you are doing a good job or not. It's something very objective with objective data, completely anonymous, to have a big feedback to understand what's going on in your room. Uh, what's my take home message? Just in a, in a few words, it's a new technology and that can help you for monitoring implementation, implementation of different uh, guidelines such uh, I saw you in this presentation, or just to monitor uh, an educational program that you want to uh, implement in your anesthesia. But don't forget that uh, we are using more and more than uh, uh, we talk today, more and more technology uh, in our uh, department, wards and operating room, or just in ICU. And for uh, a care, um, care station inside solution, it's just um, for you, a, um, a kind of partnership that can help you to elevate and have better outcomes. But don't forget that it's a kind of second brain for you, but at the end you 
keep having in your hand the control of your anesthesia uh, ranges and your anesthesia uh, solution to uh, improve uh, the patient outcomes. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you very much indeed. Come and join me and <laughs> Frederick as well. Come up on the stage and we've got some questions. It's nice to know that things can be done to improve the quality of anesthesia for our patients and have some objective feedback according to metrics. That's fascinating. Frederick, a question for the audience from you, which is that the survey of anesthesiologists you reviewed indicated nursing resistance to continuous monitoring was a concern. What are the keys to drive successful implementation technology acceptance? I think there are multiple keys. I mean, the first one is to clearly explain that these monitoring systems are very different from the existing systems we are using today in the OR and the ACU. Uh, and then, uh, of course, I think it's when they try the system that they will start to understand the potential value. They will start to understand that it will enable the early uh, detection of clinical deterioration, and at the end, it will even actually decrease their workload. So I think it's a process, and we have to go step by step. It's like for any implementation of any new strategy. I mean, it takes probably a, a bit of time. Uh, but, uh, but once they understand the potential value, and also once they, they get the feedback from patients, because I think patients also have very often or report the feeling of safety. They know an electronic device is watching them basically uh, uh, continuously. So they, they get this feedback from patients, and they quickly and and easily understand the potential value. But the, the first, very first step is clearly to explain these systems are completely different from the classical pulse oximeter you would bring from the OR and then start using in on the wards. Fantastic, thank you. Jan, yeah, I've got a question for you as well. What's the most effective education and communication strategy to share care station insights data with your team? Do you share the data outside of the Department of Anesthesiology? So the question is about the, what's, what we are sharing with, uh, with the staff. Um, to be honest, some of the anesthesiologists are very interesting on what's going on and about their own data. And some of them who are less interesting about kind of big data don't really want to know what's going on with their data. But it's very um, variable in, in the team, but most of them are interesting to see what, what what's going on? Because um, in France, for example, we have many uh, nurse anesthetic in the operating room. And to be honest, anesthesiologists are uh, in operating room at in the induction, and we are staying sometime. It depends on the uh, kind of surgery, but the uh, maintenance of general anesthesia is done by nurse anesthetic. So you have a couple of room to uh, to check, and this this solution can help you to have a big over overview of what's going on and with this kind of data you can teach for nurse anesthetic or just residents that the impact of small uh, variation of your anesthesia. Thank you. I mean I think that would be fantastic. I'd love to see that sort of thing in my department. I think although Big Brother might be watching me I think it'd be nice to know how I'm doing. Um, I've got a question that's been asked me and if you've got any more questions don't forget the microphones either side and if you want to ask anonymously, please do use Slido. Um, so a question I've got, which is, I demonstrated the use of ultrasound to evaluate cardiac function. What's the comparative level of training required for the four-chamber view versus more frequent use cases such as line placement? Um, so in the UK, there are a variety of training schemes to get people up to a, a point-of-care ultrasound-focused question for cardiac ultrasound. And the average number of cases that you need to be able to do is 50. And I teach a lot of people. I teach anesthesiologists, I teach acute physicians, emergency department physicians, and things like that. And people who've had exposure to ultrasound previously, such as line placement, I find that they have those sort of eye-hand coordinatory skills much better, um, and they're able to take to it. And in terms of trying to get people up to speed, certainly within the UK, for example, the Association of Anesthetists, are running courses now called the Periop Pocus, saying, okay, so you're an anaesthetist, you want to know more about interoperative management, here's something you can do with ultrasound. They're following the same guidelines with 50 cases and we're going out and teaching people how you can do it interoperatively. And when I have people who are doing those sorts of things with me, 
I do an unselected trauma list, and uh, I will, whilst we're waiting for the surgeon and stuff like that, will very often put a cardiac probe on a patient and have a look. And it's amazing what you find. The little old lady who's got the fractured neck of femur, who's got the little systolic murmur that the baby doctor has picked up, turns out sometimes to be something a little bit more sinister, and actually turns out possibly for the reason that they've fallen over and broken the hip in the first place. So about 50 cases or so. Um, and we're just asking binary questions. Is there something worrying? Should I be phoning a friend about it? Um, got another question, which we got as well, and um, we had pre-submitted as well, which was uh, for you, Frederick. Um, can we rely on Bluetooth connectivity for mobile monitoring on the wards? Everybody on the ward is on their phone the whole time. Is that going to interfere, or are there more um, clinically safe hospital systems that we can use? Yeah, as I tried to explain in my presentation, I mean, the problem of Bluetooth connectivity is uh, disruptions. I mean, we all experience disruptions when we are using uh, earpods, or it's not a big deal when you are listening music, right? <laughs> But if you really rely on these monitoring systems to detect clinical deterioration as soon as it may happen, uh, we clearly need to trust uh, the connectivity protocols. That's why I think, and the good news, that there are now medical-grade pro connectivity protocols which have been specifically developed to ensure we get vital sign information 100% of the time. So I think it, it's available, so we should prioritize, of course, these kind of tools. Okay, thank you. And Jan, got a question for you. <clears throat> what part of the LPV dashboard was most useful for defining the objectives and analysing the evolution of protective ventilation guidelines? <laughs> what part of the dashboard was most useful in defining the objectives and analysing the evolution of practice uh, for ventilation practices? Which was the key which bit? Part? Yeah. yeah. Was it which part in... Interesting question because for um, for this part, uh, maybe you're talking about the study I, I show uh, in these slides. Um, it was not the, the big deal was uh, recruitment manner. Okay, it was very hard to put it for uh, for for the team. Even we had some pop up, and when we take a look today at different uh, data, we are pretty good for a low tidal volume we can see on this on the dashboard we are pretty good for the peep but for the recruitment manner it's it keep being hard and we can see on data uh, since the study that the the rate is not always very uh, very high less than expected with our team great thank you and i've, I've got one question probably the last one for us which is uh, me and then i have one for you. Why well, you got one for me? Oh, okay. Well, do you ask your one, then that's fine. Go for it. <laughs> um, yeah, you, you, you showed these very interesting new ideas of, uh, uh, about the use of uh, the ultrasound probe. Uh, one of the, uh, the usual uh, um, concern around, around doctors with the use of ultrasound is about the, uh, the learning curve, so the, the operator dependency. Uh, what, what can you say about that? Uh, how, how is it? Is it easy to, to, to learn those new methods? Uh, is it difficult? How, how long does it take to, to learn? So uh, in ultrasonographic training for point of care diagnostics, we often say that people have their epiphany at scan number 10. And what happens is, is that they get that eye-hand coordination, they look at stuff, and then suddenly around the 10th scan, they get this magic light bulb moment and they go, aha, what I'm seeing on my ultrasound screen Putting that with what I understand about my clinical patient, I really get it. That drives them forwards. Um, and about, about six, seven years ago, we did a survey of practice in the UK for looking at point of care echocardiography, so for heart scanning. Uh, and we found that those people that managed to get past 10 scans would then rapidly go on to do the 50 for accreditation. So it really does strike home that once you've got 10 scans under your belt, you get your hand in and then you get to see a merit up with a clinical scenario, you suddenly think, this means something to me, and then they push on. I think that's about all we've got time for, actually. So um, it just remains for me to say thank you very much to Frederick and Jan, our speakers. Thank you for thank Marco you. for hosting us as well. And thank you for having a good rest of the conference.